Hello everyone and welcome. My name is Karen Beckman and I'm the Interim Director of the Penn Humanities Forum and a professor here at Penn in the Department of the History of Art. It's my great pleasure to welcome you here tonight for what I'm sure will be both an important and a challenging conversation. Before I introduce tonight's speakers, let me begin, as always, by thanking Jennifer Conway, Sarah Varney, and Kate Aid for all their help with the forum's programs. Um, they're really terrific uh, people to work with. Over the course of this year's Humanities Forum on the topic of violence, we have worked not only to feature the scholarship of humanists such as Brian Rosen, Anya Lumba, but also to consider how humanists can participate in conversations that concern us all and that bridge the humanities, the social sciences, and the sciences. We saw this in the conversation that emerged out of political scientist Lars Erik Siedemann's presentation on the relationship between inequality and violence. We will see it again on April 9th when Johns Hopkins nursing professor Jacqueline Campbell will discuss gender-based violence in a global frame. And we'll see it tonight when we are brought together by our shared interest in sustaining life itself in the forms that we enjoy it and by our belief that research, teaching, and academic freedom play a vital role in what humans have to contribute to this effort. It is an exciting moment for us at Penn for at least a couple of reasons that concern us tonight. First, there is now a widely held and growing belief among our faculty members and students that there are great benefits to thinking across disciplinary boundaries. And I'm very happy tonight in our audience we have, I think, somewhere Professor Peter Strzok, um, who is directing Penn's Integrated Studies program, which allows students to take courses that are co-taught by three professors, one from the humanities, one from the social sciences, and one from the sciences, on big topics like reality, or even bigger, the universe, things like that. Um, really big issues from different disciplinary perspectives. Second, we have a growing number of faculty who are concerned with the question of how ideas about sustainability need to be integrated into all aspects of the curriculum. And this question is bringing together people like Dan Garafalo, Penn's first sustainability coordinator, with scholars like uh, Penn professors of Germanic languages, Bethany Wigan and Simon Richter, who's sitting here on the front row. Um, so Bethany, for example, teaches a course entitled Sustainability and Utopianism, which considers what art and literature can do to combat climate change. Recently, I attended a faculty seminar that was organized by Penn Center for Teaching and Learning with faculty and staff from all parts of the university to think about what it means to consider pedagogy through the lens of sustainability, um, and that left all the participants hungry for more meetings, which is not always the case with the meetings that I go to. Anyway, let me tell you more about our speakers tonight. Michael Mann was appointed Distinguished Professor of Meteorology at Penn State in 2013, where he holds joint appointments in the Departments of Meteorology and Geosciences, as well as the Earth and Environmental Systems Institute. He also directs the university's Earth System Science Center. He took his BA in Physics and Applied Math from Berkeley, his MS in Physics from Yale, and his PhD in Geology and Geophysics, also from Yale. He is a fellow of the American Geophysical Union and the American Meteorological Society. Mann's research, as I'm sure many of you know, involves the use of theoretical models and observational data to better understand Earth's climate system. He is the author of well over 150 referee journal articles and a co-founder of and contributor to the award-winning science website realclimate.org. Mann has also written two great books, Dire Predictions, Understanding Global Warming, and also the Hockey, Stick and, uh, the Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars, Dispatches from the Front Lines. He was a lead author on Observed Climate Variability and Change, which formed part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, third scientific assessment report in 2001. In 2002, he received um, the NOAA's Outstanding Publication Award and was named one of the 50 lead visionaries in science and technology by Scientific American. His work with other authors of the IPCC panel report contributed to the award of the 2007 Nobel Peace Prize. In 2012, he was awarded the Hans Oeschger Medal of the European Geosciences Union, and in 2013, the National Conservation Achievement Award for Science by the National Wildlife Federation. In 2013, Bloomberg Markets magazine named Mann one of its 50 most influential people. 
Ben Horton is Professor of Marine Sciences at the Institute of Marine and Coastal Science of Rutgers University, where he studies global sea level change, as well as earthquake and tsunami hazards. Before joining Rutgers in 2013, Horton was on the Earth and Environmental Science faculty here at the University of Pennsylvania. And all I can say is I wish he hadn't left. He was appointed a fellow at the Geological Society of America in 2013. His other honors include the Linnean Society Award, for contributions to biological diversity and evolution in 2004, the W. Storrs Cole Memorial Research Award for contributions to micropaleontology from the Geological Society of America in 2007, and a Medal for Research Excellence by the Commanding General of the North Atlantic Division of the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers in 2010. He holds a PhD in geography from the University of Durham. Horton has published extensively in leading journals, among them Science, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Nature, Geoscience, and Geology. He is a contributing author to Climate Change 2013, the fifth assessment report of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. He is also project leader of the International Geoscience Program 588, Preparing for Coastal Change, and the scientific advisor to the future ocean research of the German Research Foundation. In recent work, he helped develop predictive models of relative sea level change along the mid-Atlantic coastline, one of the most in-depth examinations of past, present, and future sea level rise of any region in the United States. We have no better guides for this conversation than tonight's interlocutors, and I believe that we are lucky to live in a world with gifted scientific re researchers like the two guests we have tonight. Indeed, last year when I was asked to speak at the PhD graduation ceremony with the instructions, please be inspiring, it was to Michael Mann and his spirit of courageous thinking that I turned. This is what I said. Our training as scholars equips us with a willingness to jump into difficult spaces, but this in itself is not enough. For we also need to find ways to communicate with those who are more threatened and less excited by this difficulty. Describing his shift from being a scientist reluctant to offer his personal opinion about policy decisions to one committed to doing so, Michael Mann states, and I quote, despite the battle scars I've suffered from having served on the front lines of the climate wars, and they are numerous, I remain convinced that there is nothing more noble than striving to communicate in terms that are simultaneously accurate and accessible the societal implications of our scientific knowledge. And so in the spirit of that, please join me in welcoming our speakers tonight. Okay, um, good evening everybody. It's um, great to be back at Penn and see so many um, friendly faces. So um, Mike and I spoke about how to um, put this together. And what we thought we'd begin with is some, um, some detailed scientific work on answering this uh, first, first order question of whether sea level is rising. But it's not quite as simple as it may sound. Um, if we look at the response both nationally and internationally to sea level rise, it's rather a piecemeal response based around the beliefs of a variety of different policy makers on whether the scientists have any integrity in their own data. But I think we're all quite aware that with sea level rise, even in the smallest amounts, it can cause devastating effects. Um, sea level rise um, floods coastal lands. Um, it causes devastating erosion. It can um, contaminate aquifers and agricultural soils. It can destroy valuable habitats for wildlife, fish, animals, or plants. Sea level rise um, accentuates the impact of a storm surge. Um, it means it floods a greater distance inland and the storm surge has more power. And we can see this um, iconic image that we have here of um, seaside heights in New Jersey. After Hurricane Sandy, and you have a roller coaster being plunged beneath the waves. Sea level rise would also threaten the vulnerability of coastal populations. Millions of people live along their coastline, but they will have to be um, displaced. They will have to relocate as a result of sea level rise. Many low-lying coastal islands will be lost as a result of this phenomenon. So the topic of sea level rise is of great interest to society, but it is not quite as simple as it may sound. Indeed, in North Carolina, you don't actually need to worry about sea level rise at all. 
So on this particular image here is a photocopy of a leaflet that was handed out just before I was to talk at a workshop in North Carolina. This is part of a project that Mike and I are running, and we're looking at trying to provide the best possible information on sea level rise and inundation from hurricanes along the US Atlantic coast. So we set up a series of workshops in different coastal states. And in North Carolina, we invited along policymakers, um, federal, state, and city. We invited along stakeholders groups. We had um, people who were interested in the economy of North Carolina, residential landowners, etc. Anyhow, just before I'm about to speak, we had this particular leaflet was handed out by the president of um, the NC20, which is a group of coastal counties. And they came up with three bullet points, which I don't think you may, you may not be able to read from the back. But the first bullet point stated that there is no scientific evidence for an acceleration in sea level. The second bullet point says quite hilariously, that there's no correlation between sea level rise and temperature. And on the basis of those two points, they said that there is no statistical um, uh, proof of the estimate that we were providing to North Carolina of a rate of rise of sea level of around a metre or 39 inches by 2100. The NC20 group were, pa were powerful and persuasive enough that the North Carolina General Assembly passed a law requiring that any projected rates of sea level rise for their coastline does not include any acceleration in sea level, that it should be limited to our historical trends. So sea level rise isn't that simple. If you want to understand sea level rise, not only do you need to understand the historical trends, but you also must go back through time. You must not only understand the trends and magnitudes of sea level rise, we need to understand the processes that control them. So what I'd like to do over the next 15 minutes is provide you with that information. And so you can look at this leaflet and be informed and say that this leaflet is misinforming, is very dishonest to the, to the landowners of North Carolina. So what about our historical information? Well, our historical information is in the form of instrumental measurements, as shown on this slide. In the red, we have our tide gauge data. So tide gauges are located throughout our planet. They record the high and the low water levels every single day, the average of which is sea level. In the red, we have the average of 23 tide gauges distributed around the oceans of our planet, and they record sea level rise at about 2 millimetres per year, or 8 inches in a century. In the insert, we have satellite-based measurements, and these satellite-based measurements, we have satellites that orbit the Earth and they record the sea surface height, and they have shown over the 20 or so years of measurements from 1992 to 2012, a rate of rise of around 3 millimetres per year. So the next question is, what's controlling these rates of rise? Well, first of all, we turn to our oceans. So as our oceans warm up, they expand. Each individual water molecule expands a tiny fraction when you warm it up. But if you multiply that by the depths of the oceans, you increase the volume. And this has been the dominant control in the 20th century. This thermal um, expansion accounts for around 50% of the historical rise that we see. So this is a volume issue. We also have a mass issue. So if we look at our mountain caps and glaciers, in the summer they melt because of increased insulation, but traditionally these are balanced by precipitation in the form of snowfall in the winter. But with climate change we have enhanced melting and we have diminished precipitation, so we have a mass balance problem. And these have contributed to sea level rise in the 20th century. But as we move through into the 21st century, they will only add a minimal amount because there really isn't that much of this type of ice on our planet. But in contrast, we have our ice sheets, Greenland and Antarctica. These are also showing melting, enhanced melting in the summer and diminished melting in the winter and diminished precipitation in the winter. Furthermore, we have meltwater on the surface of our ice sheets that scientists believe are seeping beneath the ice sheets, lubricating the bed, meaning that these ice sheets move at a faster and a faster pace. 
And these are colossal bodies of ice. The Greenland ice sheet covers some 600,000 square kilometers. It has nearly seven meters of sea level within it. Antarctica is the big giant. Antarctica covers some five million square kilometers. It has enough sea level within it, to, or enough ice to raise sea level by a colossal 60 meters. And we have very worrying signs. If we look at the observational period in the 20th century, these ice sheets contribute around 25% to sea level rise. In the 21st century, this has risen to 40%. We also must consider land level changes, because when you think about sea level rise, you need to know what the land is doing and what the oceans are doing. So land can uplift or rise, or it can sink or subside, depending upon geological forces. In this particular photograph, we're showing Sumatra, where I'm stood in the, on the far left-hand side. This area of land has been subsided around two metres as a result of the Indian Ocean earthquake um, um, and tsunami in 2004. Land can also sink as a result of human processes. The re removal of fluids in the form of oil or gas or, or water from our freshwater aquifers. When the land sinks, it accentuates or enhances sea level rise. Now, some work that was done by Benjamin Franklin um, PhD student, um, Simon Engelhart, he showed that along the US Atlantic coast, the land is subsiding. It's subsiding as a result of geological forces related to an extinct ice sheet. So where we are sat tonight, the land is subsiding at around two millimeters per year. And that is the reason why, if you look at the Atlantic City tide gauges in New Jersey, they are recording sea level rise rates of four millimetres per year, nearly double the um, global average. So now we've understood the processes. We've observed that the um, um, instrumental records show sea level rise. The next question is, is it beyond natural variability? And to do this, you need to go back through time. So this graphic here shows the changes in sea level for the New Jersey coast over the last 10,000 years. The 10,000 years period is a, a geological time period known as the Holocene. It is an interglacial. It is a time period where the earth warmed up, therefore our oceans expanded. It's a time period where the earth warmed up and melted ice sheets that existed over North America and Northwestern Europe. As a result of that, over the 10,000 years, sea level rose by around 25 metres, over 65 feet. But the rate of rise was not linear. In the early part of the Holocene, from 10 to 6, we had rates of around 6 millimetres per year, slightly greater than what we're experiencing at present, but exactly the type of rates that we will experience in the next few decades. In the last 4,000 years, it slowed down because the Earth had, had, had reached a point of stabilization in terms of its climate, and the ice sheets had become extinct. So the question to ask is, so if you've got these sea level rise rates over the last 10,000 years, how did it affect our coastlines? And fortunately, we're able to provide an insight into this. So these are some maps that we drew, and I'm going to show you 10 maps. There are 1,000 year intervals from 10,000 years to present. You can see the present day shoreline located in black. You see Chesapeake Bay, Delaware Bay, Long Island, and Cape Cod. And it's the, um, um, the coastline 10,000 years ago is at the boundary between the green and the turquoise. Increasing shades of blue are increasing depths below sea level. As we go through the greens to the um, um, yellows and the oranges are increasing elevations above sea level. So at 10,000 years ago, sea levels were some 65 feet below present. As a result, the shoreline was some 100, greater than 100 miles away from its current position. So what do you think happens when sea level's rising at six millimetres per year? Your land retreats, forming a very unique island off of Cape Cod. 8,000 years, 7,000 years, and 6,000 years. Every single year, tens of metres of coastline are being lost. But by 6,000 years, our coastline looks something like it does today because our sea levels have stabilised. Our climate has reached an optimum, and we have no further melting of ice sheets that became extinct in North America and Europe. 
And so we move from five through to four, through to three, and two and one. And it's very interesting to note that in that time period where sea level stabilized was when all the barrier islands of the world formed. It's when all the marshes formed, our mangroves and our wetlands and our corals expanded. They are the fisheries of our world. And it's interesting to be in the museum where there are hypotheses that the birth of civilization is linked to the stabilization of sea level. So let's put this all together and look at the sea levels in the common era. So this is some work that was put together by Andrew Kemp, another Benjamin Franklin fellow from the University of Pennsylvania. And this sort of iconic image of sea levels over the last 10,000 years unfortunately displays many similarities with Michael's hockey stick of temperature. And why I mean unfortunate, I obviously would like to be associated with the Michael Mann hockey stick, is it, it portrays that there is a relationship between sea level and temperature. If we look at this graph, in the first thousand years, sea level is remarkably stable. Then at about 1,000 AD, sea level slightly rises. It slightly rises when there's a perturbation in the Earth's climate, the medieval climate anomaly. Then at around 1500 AD, sea level stabilizes or slightly falls associated with the Little Ice Age. And then right at the time period when temperature starts to pick up in the latter part of the 19th century, sea level starts to pick up. And the observational record in red here shows that sea level rise rates in the 20th century are far greater than anything we've seen for the previous 2,000 years. Statistically, our work in New Jersey states that the 20th century rates that we record in Atlantic City, we have a 95% certainty that they're faster than anything in over 43 centuries. They are at a 66% confidence interval. They're faster than anything over 67 centuries. But these modern rates of rise are dwarfed by what we're projecting for the future. So what about our rising seas of the future? Well, there are, very, there are different um, um, projections. We can go and have a look at governmental organizations, such as the NOAA assessment in 2012, illustrated by the dashed lines on here, showing their highest, intermediate, and low scenarios. We have the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, which Karen um, stated that I and Mike have been involved in, shown by the bars on the right-hand side. But as I'm talking, I thought I might as well discuss my own work on this particular matter. And what we did is we um, surveyed experts in sea level. So we produced an anonymous survey where I contacted um, 500 of, of the most published scientists globally on the topic of sea level rise. And I asked them on the two emission scenarios, low emission or high emission, the blue and the red, what their likely and very likely range of sea level is. And all of the respondents, everyone who you would consider an expert in sea level that had published in peer-reviewed literature, said that sea level was going to rise in the 21st century. But interestingly, within the sea level community, there is still hope that if we mitigate against CO2 emissions, we can significantly reduce our sea level rise. We can reduce our rises from the red scenarios. When you're talking about rates that are triple, quadruple, or greater than the rates we've seen in the 20th century, and we can keep it down to perhaps manageable levels. But do not underestimate a low rate of sea level rise. We can see these effects by looking at Hurricane Sandy. So this graphic here shows the timing of, of hurricanes that have made landfall in New York City. Hurricane Sandy in 2012, going through to Donna in 60, and historic hurricanes in 1893 and 1821. And they're plotted against our sea level rise record, both instrumental records from a tide gauge and our geological reconstructions. Now, Hurricane Sandy was a very um, unique storm, and it had a very unusual track, which may or may not be related to the lack of sea ice in the Arctic. It unfortunately occurred at high tide, which amplified the storm's surge. 
But it also unfortunately occurred when New York City experienced the highest sea levels it's had for over 120,000 years. And we can see the influence on this graph. From 1821, the storm surge in 1821 was very, very similar to Hurricane Sandy in terms of its magnitude. But sea levels were different. They're about 50 centimetres different. About a third of that is land level subsidence, but the remainder is climate change related sea level. So perhaps sea level rise gives a true indication of the economic cost of climate change. Hurricane Sandy cost $56 billion and lives were lost. It knocked out a Con Ed station, plunging Lower Manhattan into darkness. Decisions that were made early in the 20th century about where to place these substations, but they have no knowledge of where sea level is. We are currently making decisions of where we place our infrastructure now, and these take no account of sea level rise. It's interesting to know that the faint blue blow there is a new um, World Trade Center. It stands a mere three feet above sea level. So what about a Hurricane Sandy in the 21st century? Well, the scientific community still has not decided on, or still has not figured out whether in a climate warming scenario, whether there will be significant changes in the track, frequency, or intensity of hurricanes in the 21st century. But the one thing that we do know is that sea level is going to rise. In some projections that we made for New Jersey, we illustrated that Hurricane Sandy, thought of as a one in 100 year event, by 2050, less than 40 years, will be a one in a decade event. So to summarize, the US coast has 29% of the national population. It has five of the 10 largest cities. If we think globally, eight of the nine largest cities are located in the coastal zone. In the US, the US coast generates 45% of the gross domestic product, which was $6.6 .6 trillion in 2012. Now, future sea level rise poses a danger both to the population, economics, and the e infrastructure of our coastal zone. And I'd like to leave you with one last anecdote which comes from my knowledge of geological sea levels. So from 20,000 years ago to today, global temperatures went up around 5 degrees C, 9 degrees Fahrenheit. That caused two-thirds of the ice on our planet to melt. That caused our sea levels to raise more than 350 feet. If we do not mitigate against CO2 emissions, we are on a track for a further 5 degrees C rise. The question I ask you is how much of our remaining ice, over 60 metres, will melt? Personally, I don't think we can handle more than 2 to 3%. Now, I've taken this message, obviously, to a learned audience such as yourselves. We've been to workshops to try and provide the best possible scientific information. I've had the fortune of being able to talk to the media. University of Pennsylvania were great in this regard. The aim of this is to try and provide information of past, present, and future climate and sea level change, but hopefully to persuade people to do something about it. Thank you very much. Okay, well, uh, thanks very much, uh, Ben. Uh, it's a real uh, pleasure to be doing this event with, with Ben Horton, who is uh, both a friend and a deeply respected colleague and a collaborator. Um, and to be doing this event here at the University of Pennsylvania, I also have a, a personal connection with Penn. My grandfather got his uh, degree here. My father got uh, both of his degrees, his uh, undergraduate degree and his PhD in math here at uh, the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm especially pleased that uh, a colleague of his from, uh, from uh, the University of Massachusetts, where he was a math professor and where I grew up, is here in the audience um, along with his wife. And I see a number of friends uh, that I recognize. Uh, so I'm going to continue uh, talking about some of the same themes that Ben was talking about, perhaps from a, a slightly different perspective. Um, this is, after all, a forum on global warming and the attack on sciences. And I will be touching on both of those things. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the underlying science, why we know that uh, we are warming the planet and changing the climate. 
And unfortunately, as Ben has already demonstrated, um, why there is uh, some uh, resistance, um, some societal resistance to accepting uh, the risks that we face and doing something about it. And as it happens, I, I speak uh, from personal experience because of this graph, the hockey stick graph that I published a, a decade and a half ago, and it became sort of a symbol in the climate change debate. And it uh, basically uh, turned me into a public figure in the climate change debate and, uh, and a public uh, figure who has uh, dealt with uh, efforts to discredit um, this iconic graph, uh, the hockey stick. Um, so it sort of placed me uh, as, um, you know, our, uh, as um, uh, we heard in the introduction, reluctantly and accidentally in the center of this uh, societal debate over human-caused climate change. And so I'll talk about some of my personal experiences in the center of that debate as well, um, uh, experiences that are recounted in my book, The Hockey Stick and the Climate Wars. The first point that I want to make, uh, well, first I'll turn this on. Uh, the first point that I want to make is that the underlying science, as we've already seen, is actually fairly straightforward. Uh, the greenhouse effect is not controversial science. We've known about it for nearly two centuries. Joseph Fourier, uh, and again, mathematicians, of course, know who Fourier uh, was, uh, the Fourier series, Fourier analysis. Uh, early 19th century scientists like Joseph Fourier understood that certain gases in our atmosphere, greenhouse gases, have this warming influence on the planet. And so we've known about that for nearly two centuries, and we've refined our understanding of uh, the full um, uh, extent of the greenhouse effect and some of what we call feedback mechanisms, amplifying factors within the climate system that can cause even more warming uh, when uh, you initially warm through an increase in these greenhouse gases. So that's not controversial science. It's nearly two century old basic physics and chemistry. The fact that we are increasing the concentrations of these gases is not controversial. We're measuring the buildup of CO2 in the atmosphere. Uh, this graph is one of those graphs that is uh, outdated as soon as you produce it. Um, it turns out uh, that I produced this graph a few years ago, but we now have to add another uh, tick mark to the vertical scale because just last year, for the first time, probably in millions of years, we're not sure, but probably in millions of years, we passed 400 parts per million CO2 in the atmosphere. In fact, that happened last June. As you can see, there's an annual wiggle. And so as CO2 increases, there's also a seasonal cycle. Um, and you tend to see a peak in the uh, uh, boreal spring, early summer. Uh, last year, that peak brought us above 400 parts per million, somewhere up here, in May. This year, it's mid-March, and we've already passed it. And so pretty soon, we will be above 400 parts per million for the entire seasonal cycle. And in a matter of decades, it won't be 400 ppm CO2 we're flirting with. It'll be 450 ppm CO2 that we'll be flirting with. And I'll talk about the implications of that shortly. So that's really you know, all you need to know. Basic physics and, 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 and chemistry we've known for two centuries, irrefutable measurements that we are changing the concentrations, elevating the concentrations of these gases in an unprecedented manner what I would not be able to explain to you as a scientist would be if the Earth were not warming up because of that. And of course, the observations tell us that the, war the Earth is warming up. It's warmed up a little less than a degree Celsius, about a degree and a half Fahrenheit so far. And if you're a critic, and there are critics who don't believe those thermometer records, for example. Ben talked about uh, some of the critics who don't believe in some of the data on sea level rise. Um, if you don't believe in those thermometer measurements, I could show you dozens of independent lines of evidence that all tell an internally consistent story of a planet that is warming up and a climate that is changing much as we expect it to as we continue to increase the concentrations of these gases. So what does that hold for the future? Well, what I'm showing you here is a graph that was just uh, unveiled yesterday uh, as it happens. Uh, this is an article I wrote for the April issue of Scientific American, and they put it online yesterday. Um, so this is literally hot, hot off the presses. And what it shows it sort of relates to what Ben was talking about earlier. Um, here's zero degrees pre-industrial. That's two degrees Celsius. Okay, two degrees Celsius is the amount of warming relative to pre-industrial time. 
about three and a half degrees Fahrenheit, where scientists who study the impacts of climate change will tell you we start to see the most dangerous and potentially irreversible changes in our climate. And so two degrees C is probably as good as any a threshold of where we really start to wander into what can reasonably be termed dangerous human interference with the climate. Of course, as we'll see shortly, in some respects, we're already there. But at two degrees warming of the planet, across the boards, we will likely see very negative impacts of climate change with regard to food security, water security, national security, human health, biodiversity, etc. Well, what this graph shows is that we can still take actions, we can still mitigate, we can reduce our carbon emissions in time that we avoid crossing that two degrees Celsius warming limit. We most likely have to keep CO2 concentrations well below that 450 parts per million number that I mentioned earlier to do that. Um, and as I said, if we continue with business as usual, we will be at 450 parts per million in a matter of couple decades. Now, if we don't do anything about the problem, if we continue with business as usual, and there's some uncertainty because there's uncertainty in the climate model projections, we'll probably be somewhere between three and five degrees, closer to four to five degrees warmer as a planet by the end of the century Celsius, seven to nine degrees Fahrenheit warmer as a planet, twice that much 18 degrees Fahrenheit warmer in the Arctic because of the amplifying factor of melting ice and more absorption of incoming sunlight. And in that scenario, if we continue with business as usual and we warm the planet potentially four to five degrees Celsius by the end of this century, we will be talking about a different planet. In the words of uh, um, one of our respected colleagues, James Hansen of the NASA Goddard Institute for Space Studies, we will be leaving our children and grandchildren a fundamentally different planet. It won't be the planet that we grew up on. Now, I used to end that sequence of slides with the, uh, the poor polar bear stranded on the ice flow there. Um, and increasingly, I've come to recognize, as have many of my colleagues, that although the, the po polar bear and uh, the, the perils that the polar bear faces because of the melting of its environment, literally the Arctic sea ice is diminishing before our eyes, um, sort of became a poster child for climate change and global warming. The problem is that to many people that makes it feel like a very remote problem. It's something way off in the Arctic that you know, maybe it'll be a problem in the future, but you know, it's not affecting me. How is it affecting me? So now everywhere I go and give a lecture, uh, I try to talk very specifically about how climate change is impacting us now where we live in our actual lives. Um, when I was in uh, Texas a year ago, in San Angelo, Texas, uh, I wanted to talk about the Texas drought, the devastating, unprecedented 2011 Texas drought. Uh, they lost 25% of their livestock in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, Agriculture was decimated across the state. And so I went online and found an image of the 2011 uh, Texas drought, summer drought. What I didn't realize until somebody pointed out to me was that the image was from San Angelo, Texas, where I was speaking. It was what they used to call Fisher Lake or Lake Fisher um, before it dried up in that drought and hasn't come back. The day before I was set to go up to Maine, to Portland, Maine, to give a lecture about climate change, an article came out in the New York Times um, talking about how, in fact, in Maine and across the northern U.S., um, there is a very real impact oops, that climate change is now having on moose populations. Uh, pests that afflict the, the moose are living through the mild winters, um, and increasingly, uh, moose populations are being uh, detrimentally influenced by you know, increased tick populations and, and, and other pests. I gave a talk down in Florida. Um, that's the, what we call the king tide. Um, there's a seasonal high tide that happens every year in Florida. Um, and it didn't used to flood the streets of Miami Beach. Now it 
every time that king tide comes, it floods the streets of Miami Beach. It's that rising tide. It's a fluctuation on top of a rising tide. I gave a talk a couple months ago in Northwest Missouri. Well, it turns out that North, uh, Northwest Missouri State University, which is located in the bullseye of the 2012 Midwestern heat wave, which was an unprecedented event. But it turns out, if we continue with business as usual in a matter of, decade, in a matter of decades, what we call an unprecedented event today will be a typical summer day. Those are the sorts of changes that we're talking about. Again, if we continue with business as usual. I was in uh, California uh, a couple weeks ago, um, and of course they've had a record drought, um, and it's almost certain that climate change is playing some role in the extreme nature of that drought. Uh, the talk was actually in Santa Cruz, at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, I don't know if there are any uh, Santa Cruz alums in the audience here. Oh yeah? Yeah. Well then, you probably recognize that. <laughs> banana slug. Well, it turns out, and I'm not making this up, banana slugs are threatened by climate change <laughs> because the redwood, that coastal environment that supports redwood forests, that, that microscale environment, um, may very well uh, disappear as large-scale atmospheric conditions uh, dry um, in the future. Again, if we continue on this course that we're on. And here, Again, Ben has already talked quite a bit about the devastating nature of Hurricane Sandy earlier, uh, you know, just a, a couple years ago now. Um, that was an unprecedented storm in many respects, and while we can debate the precise ways that climate change might have uh, influenced the severity, the intensity of that storm, there's no question that the storm-related flooding occurred on top of at least a foot of sea level rise that had occurred because of global warming, human-caused climate change. And that was the, the difference between an event that would have been bad and an event that was catastrophic. Um, mentioned I have ties to uh, the University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. My grandparents, uh, when I was growing up, lived here in Philadelphia. And every summer, we would spend time in Philadelphia, and we would go to the Jersey Shore. Um, we'd go to Atlantic City or Brigantine. And so it was devastating for me to witness um, the, uh, the, the devastation uh, that uh, Sandy wrought on these places, these iconic uh, places that I uh, remember from my childhood. This is a scene, part of uh, the boardwalk that was destroyed in Atlantic City where we used to go every year. And so if the evidence is this clear, that climate change is not only real, caused by us, but it represents a substantial threat now and an increasingly greater threat if we do nothing about it, why has there been no action? Um, and that's really a rhetorical question, because um, we sort of know why that is the case. Um, and it takes us from the domain of science into the domain of, of policy and politics and what I call the climate wars. This very well-organized, well-funded campaign, um, decades long now, to deny the threat that climate change actually poses. And ultimately, where does it come from? I mean, I'm, I live in Pennsylvania. I'm in central Pennsylvania State College. Um, uh, you folks are mostly in this room, uh, Pennsylvanians. Pennsylvania is a fossil fuel state. It's where we discovered oil in this country. Um, it was built on coal. And now, of course, um, we are uh, developing the Marcellus Shale as an increasingly important and controversial aspect of our state economy. So if ever there were a fossil fuel state, I'm sorry, Texas, I'm sorry, Oklahoma, I think uh, Pennsylvania um, has uh, as much a right to that title as, as any state. And, and we understand as Pennsylvanians um, that uh, it, it's difficult. We have a huge infrastructure. A lot of people have jobs that are related to this infrastructure that we have for deriving energy from fossil fuels. And it's not easy to change. And there are vested interests who understandably don't want to see things change uh, because they're profiting greatly from what uh, our former president, George W. Bush, referred to as our addiction to fossil fuels. And so um, their strategy was betrayed in a, a memo that was leaked back in 2002 by a Republican pollster, Frank Luntz. He was advising his clients, uh, uh, fossil fuel interests, that there was a closing window of opportunity, that the American public was becoming convinced 
that climate change was real and that it poses a threat. And if they were to become convinced that there was a scientific consensus, they would demand that action be taken. But, Luntz concluded, based on the polling, based on the focus groups that he had done, there was still a window of opportunity left to insert doubt and confusion and controversy uh, to convince the public that the science was grossly uncertain, that there was still a scientific debate about whether climate change uh, is even real. And he encouraged uh, them to fund, to provide lavish uh, funding for front groups and um, organizations whose sole role essentially is to sow doubt about the underlying science of climate change. And so we have powerful senators like Senator James Inhofe, uh, the senior senator of Oklahoma, who has described climate change as the single, sorry, the greatest hoax. Could it be the greatest hoax ever perpetrated on the American people? Asked James, Hans, uh, James Inhofe. <laughs> um, well, that summer, um, when he uh, was uh, claiming that climate change was uh, a hoax, he had been uh, invited uh, to be the keynote speaker at the annual conference of the Heartland Institute, the annual climate change conference of the Heartland Institute. It's an industry-funded uh, front group. Um, uh, used to be funded largely by tobacco interests um, to discredit the science linking the use of tobacco products to human health ailments. Uh, today, they're largely funded by fossil fuel interests to do the same thing, to convince the public that climate change is indeed a hoax. And they had invited James Inhofe to be their keynote speaker that summer, um, 2011. He had to cancel out at the last minute, unfortunately, because he had grown ill um, swimming in a lake back in his home state of Oklahoma that was suffering from an algal bloom as a result of the unprecedented heat and drought that Oklahoma was experiencing that summer. So now one might ask, how did I find myself the center of you know, what might rightly be described as a circus, a circus atmosphere when it comes to discussions of climate change, the evidence for climate change, and the risks posed by climate change. And as I've already said, um, it really relates to this graph that my colleagues and I published um, a decade and a half ago that demonstrated this hockey stick-like nature to recent warming, that the warming of the past century really does appear to be unprecedented as far back as we could go, uh, a thousand years. Just as Ben has shown, um, sea level, the rate of sea level rise, unprecedented as far back as we can confidently go. And it got a name. It got called the hockey stick. It was featured in the prominent summary for policymakers of the 2001 third assessment of the IPCC, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and it became this symbol, this symbol in the climate change debate. And because of that, it became an object of attack by those seeking to discredit the case for concern over climate change, as if our entire understanding of climate change derived from a single graph that I had published with two co-authors a decade and a half ago, rather than the dozens of lines of evidence provided by thousands of scientists over more than 100 years that tells us that climate change is real, it's caused by us, it represents a threat. It's not just my conclusion, it's not just Ben's conclusion, it's the conclusion of every major scientific organization in the US. It's the conclusion of the National Academy of Sciences um, established by uh, Abraham Lincoln in the 19th century. It's the conclusion of the National Academies of all the major industrial nations. Um, and yet there's some who'd like to think, or like you to think, that it's all based on a single graph that my co-authors and I published 15 years ago and that if they can just take down that one iconic graph, that the entire case for concern over climate change will collapse like a house of cards. That's what they'd like you to think. And it doesn't matter to them that there's now a veritable hockey league. Dozens of these kinds of reconstructions done by different groups using different types of data, different methods, all coming to the conclusion that the recent warming really does appear to be unprecedented as far back as we could go. Now, there was a little bit of a, a hiccup um, last year um, there was a, a group that uh, published the most extensive study yet of this sort. Uh, more than 80 scientists from around the world, more than 40 institutions, drawing upon the most comprehensive data set of this sort ever um, compiled, produced their own estimate of how temperatures had varied 
over the past thousand years. And as one might have feared, they completely overthrew Oh, no, sorry. No, actually, they got the same answer we got a decade and a half ago. No. Well, Joe Barton of Texas didn't really like the hockey stick curve. Um, in fact, uh, he read a criticism of the hockey stick in that leading scientific journal, the editorial pages of the Wall Street Journal, uh, criticizing our work, um, and used that as an argument for engaging in an open-ended fishing expedition, demanding all of my personal emails, every document from my entire scientific career, and those of my two senior co-authors, based on the fact that he had read this criticism of our work in the Wall Street Journal. Um, this is before uh, Barton had become a household uh, name uh, because of his infamous apology to BP um, for uh, polluting our uh, Gulf of Mexico. But this was five years earlier, in 2005, but nonetheless, um, his actions were uh, sternly rebuked by various scientific organizations, the American Association of Advancement of Science, the American Geophysical Union, the American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature. And again, yes, that was be before he had, uh, this was five years before his infamous apology to BP, lampooned here by Tom Tolles of the Washington Post. Um, well, his attack on us was um, denounced by editorial boards around the country, New York Times, Washington Post, even his home state paper, the Houston Chronicle, wasn't very supportive of what they saw as an effort to harass scientists whose findings might not be convenient to the special interests that fund his campaigns. And by the way, I forgot to mention, and it could just be a coincidence, that he was the largest recipient of fossil fuel money in the US House of Representatives. Well. Other prominent politicians like Henry Waxman of California, who sadly has announced his retirement this year, came to our defense. And it might not be too surprising to people who are familiar with Waxman's uh, history. Um, he uh, led the effort to bring the tobacco industry to justice um, for their efforts to hide the health impacts of their product decades ago. And he came to our defense immediately when we were attacked by um, Joe Barton of Texas, um, his fellow his fellow Republican. This was a Democrat, uh, of course, was criticizing a Republican. What was remarkable here is that the greatest hero in this story turns out to have been another Republican. Okay, it was Sherwood Bullard, uh, chair of the House Energy and Co uh, sorry, the, uh, the chair of the House Science Committee. He was an old school, pro-science, pro-environmental Republican of sort of the Teddy Roosevelt mold, and he actually called out his fellow Republican, Joe Barton's actions in the harshest language of anybody, stopping just short of calling him out for engaging in modern day McCarthyism. And he wasn't the only prominent Republican to do that. John McCain co-authored an editorial in the Chronicle of Higher Education where he said that The message sent by the Congressional Committee to the three scientists was not subtle, published politically and palatable scientific results, and brace yourself for political retribution. It represents a kind of intimidation which threatens the relationship between science and public policy. That behavior must not be tolerated. It's almost unprecedented in modern American political history to see a one prominent Republican attacking a fellow Republican in such harsh language. Well, it didn't stop there, though, and, and <laughs> hey, I haven't even said anything yet. <laughs> so a few years later, um, as we, in the lead up to the all-important Copenhagen, Copenhagen summit um, in December 2009, this was the first opportunity in years for meaningful progress in dealing with the problem of climate change, and all of a sudden, a whole bunch of emails between climate scientists were released into the public domain. Um, thousands of emails between climate scientists, including myself, um, and all of a sudden, these emails were taken out of context, and individual words and phrases were taken from the emails and used to try to make it sound like climate change was indeed the hoax that uh, James Inhofe had claimed, that scientists were engaged in uh, all supposed uh, matters of, um, of of indiscretion and impropriety. 
Um, and at the time, Sarah Palin uh, wrote an op-ed where she claimed, among other things, that these emails revealed, revealed that climate experts were trying to hide the decline in global temperatures, which is really odd claim because the email she was referring to was one I had actually received from a colleague back in early 1999 on the heels of the warmest year we had ever seen. We had just finished 1998, which was the warmest year on record uh, because of a big El Nino event that pushed global temperatures up to a new record. And if anything, at that time, climate scientists were talking about the apparent acceleration of warming. There was no decline to be discussed. What they were actually talking about was a graph that they had prepared for a government report in uh, the UK that was supposed to denote temperature trends over um, uh, more than uh, a millennium, um, uh, one of which was based on a certain type of tree ring information that was known to be unreliable after 1960. These trees were known to stop reflecting temperature changes um, after about 1960, and there were various theories for why that might be true, and they had actually even published an article in the journal Nature in 1998 talking about this um, enigmatic problem, which has come to be known as the divergence problem. And so what they were talking about was in showing, producing this graph to depict temperature changes, not showing the bad data after 1960 that would be misleading to the uh, readers of that report. Um, there was absolutely nothing wrong uh, with what they had done, and the journal Nature even said so in an editorial. And I explained that and some of the other things that Sarah Palin had gotten wrong in her op-ed, in my own op-ed that the Washington Post published nine days later, and it seems to have had an impact even on Sarah Palin herself. Because just a couple of years ago, these are her words, okay, has admitted that a lot of those emails obviously weren't meant for public consumption, her words and that they could be misinterpreted if taken out of context. Of course, she was talking about her own emails that had been re released in response to a Freedom of Information Act request from her time as governor of Alaska. Well, the attacks didn't stop there. James Inhofe, based on these stolen emails, was sure that there were 17 climate scientists. He couldn't come up with 57 climate scientists, like in the movie The Manchurian Candidate, some of you may have seen. But he did have a list of 17 climate scientists who should be prosecuting, prosecuted for perpetrating the hoax of human-caused climate change as revealed by, supposedly, by these stolen emails. And I'm proud to say that I was on that list, uh, along with um, uh, Susan Solomon, uh, holder of the Presidential Medal of Science, and many other leading climate scientists. It didn't even stop there, though. That spring, newly minted Attorney General Ken Cuccinelli, in his first act as Attorney General of Virginia, Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. Uh, his first act as Attorney General was actually to try to change the state seal because it exposed a certain part of the anatomy of the Roman goddess Virtus, and he didn't think that that was really uh, appropriate. Um, it was his second act as Attorney General was to take a page from the Joe Barton playbook and attempt to uh, use his authority as Attorney General to issue a civil subpoena demanding all of my personal emails, this might sound familiar now, from the time I was at the University of Virginia from 1999 to 2005, um, based on the fact that this uh, civil subpoena, it's called a civil investigative demand, and it's reserved for the Attorney General, um, in particular, to ferret out state waste and fraud. It's typically uh, used to uh, investigate Medicare fraud. But his reasoning was that since I was working on the science of climate change when I was at the University of Virginia and the science of climate change is clearly fraudulent, this is a completely appropriate application of a civil subpoena. Well, others didn't necessarily agree with them. Um, the Union of Concerned Scientists, the American Association of University of Professors, the ACLU all spoke out against what they saw as a, an extremely dangerous precedent. Um, um, an attorney general, a renegade attorney general going after academics whose views he might not like, whose work uh, he might not approve of. And even the conservative organization, FIRE, which um, typically advocates against um, um, political correctness in academia, um, they denounced Cuccinelli's um, efforts um, because they recognize that it didn't matter what your politics are, whether you're progressive or conservative. The idea that an attorney general could abuse his authority to go after academics and scientists simply because he disagrees with them is dangerous. It's dangerous for society regardless of what your politics are. It's a bad thing 
they denounced it. 800 scientists from around the state of Virginia, and I'll be honest, I didn't even realize there were 800 scientists in the state of Virginia, um, wrote a petition uh, demanding that he withdraw his attack. The AAAS, once again, the American Meteorological Society, the journal Nature, all sharply condemned what they saw as a very clear effort by a politician closely tied to fossil fuel interests trying to intimidate scientists whose findings might be inconvenient to those interests. And even the conservative Richmond Times Dispatch that had endorsed his candidacy for attorney general um, denounced uh, his actions. In fact, I'm proud to say that the Richmond Times Dispatch in this last election for the first time ever did not endorse the Republican candidate for governor. Um, and I ended up campaigning with his opponent Terry McAuliffe, who was victorious um, and is now the governor of uh, that state. Well, the Washington Post couldn't get enough of this. They wrote at least five editorials denouncing what they termed Ken Cuccinelli's witch hunt against me in the University of Virginia. Um, and even their cartoonist, their award-winning cartoonist Tom Tolles couldn't resist commenting on the matter, not once, but twice. And I have to say, this is my personal favorite here. It's Cuccinelli up there in the judge's chair with the UVA climate case. And you, I'll be wanting to see your emails, too, to poor Galileo uh, below. And I don't mind being compared to Galileo, I must uh, confess. Uh, well, it turns out his um, civil investigative uh, demand was, was quashed by the lower court, um, really on a technicality, uh, Cuccinelli would argue, um, that in his 40-page filing to the court, he had failed to provide any evidence of wrongdoing on my part. Um, so it was thrown out. But he, of course, challenged that uh, decision all the way up to the state Supreme Court, which ruled on the case a couple years ago. Um, in fact, uh, they rejected it with prejudice, uh, which means they really don't want to see an attorney general ever come back to the court with something like that again. Well, it didn't stop there. Republicans at that time were preparing to retake control of the House of Representatives, and they telegraphed very clearly what they planned to do. When they regained control of the House of Representatives, they were going to hold a whole new set of show trials, um, putting climate scientists like myself in the hot seat and attacking us and seeking to discredit us. And I believe they would have done that were it not for the fact that prominent members of their own party, again, spoke up in this case. Sherwood Bowler, who I mentioned from earlier, now uh, unfortunately retired uh, from the House of Representatives. Um, he was likely to face a very difficult uh, congressional race um, in the primary, in the Republican primary. He was likely to be primaried by a candidate running to his far right who would be extremely well funded by a pair of brothers from Kansas. And so he decided uh, to not run again, but he was still making his views known, participating in the larger uh, public discourse. And he wrote an op-ed in the Washington Post warning his fellow Republicans that if they went down that road, if they attempted to abuse their authority by attacking scientists whose findings they don't like, they would risk forever establishing their party, his party, the party that he loves and loved, the Republican Party, as the party of anti-science. And they better not go down that road. And it turns out those show trials never materialized. It gives me a little bit of optimism that uh, maybe we will get past this poisonous, this rancorous, bad faith debate about whether the problem even exists and on to the worthy discussion that is to be had about what to do about the problem. And what to do about the problem? Well, you know, there is no magic bullet. And this is something we can talk about in the discussion here. Um, we have to make difficult choices. Uh, we need to provide energy uh, for a, a, a growing global population demanding more and more energy. We need to find a way to do that um, in a way that doesn't continue to degrade our environment. Um, and there are many different options that are on the table. Um, and there's a good faith debate to be had about what energy options we should embrace, what role does natural gas have in a transition to a clean energy future? Um, is there a role for nuclear energy? I would be ecstatic if that were the debate we were having right now in the House of Representatives rather than 
is climate change even real? That's not a worthy debate. We have to get past it. Finally, let me uh, end on this note. I, I know this is a humanities forum. And to me, um, uh, the problem of, of climate change, you know, too often it's framed as a scientific problem, problem of physics, chemistry, uh, a economics problem, do some sort of cost-benefit analysis to devise an optimal energy strategy, uh, or a policy or, 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 or political problem. But to me, it's every bit as much uh, an ethical problem, a problem of ethics, a problem of intergenerational ethics, and making sure that we do not make choices now that will mortgage the futures of our children and grandchildren. We have an ethical obligation to not leave uh, a degraded world behind for our children and grandchildren. Now, this is a, a picture of my daughter, who's now eight years old, um, at the Pittsburgh Zoo, um, and that's a polar bear on top of her, and I promise you we're not torturing her. No. <laughs> the Pittsburgh Zoo, you can walk through a, a plexiglass tunnel underneath the, the polar bear feeding pool. And it is true that if you happen to be involved in an NSF-funded project to develop climate change outreach materials for zoos and aquaria, and you know the manager of the zoo, you might be able to convince him to throw the fish in the pool when your daughter's walking underneath, which is what's happening here. But again, on a, on a serious note, um, that's really what this is about to me. It, it's about not leaving behind a degraded planet for our, our children and grandchildren. And the good news is there's still time to make the right decisions. We can still avoid that catastrophic future. Um, as I showed earlier, um, there are very plausible scenarios where we can limit the warming of the globe to below two degrees Celsius um, and most likely avoid the most severe impacts of climate change. But the fact is that there is an urgency now unlike we've ever seen before. We don't have much time. If we are going to avoid raising CO2 concentrations to 450 parts per million in the atmosphere, and we're near 400 now, and we're increasing by about three per year. If you do the math, we get to 450 in a matter of decades. That means we have to bring our emissions to a peak now, and we have to start ramping them down several percent a year. It's not going to be easy to do, but the costs of inaction far outweigh any costs of acting on this problem. And so I think I'll leave it there, and we'll hopefully have uh, some additional uh, time for discussion. Thank you. Sure. Uh, I don't have a binary opinion on it. <laughs> it's a little nuanced, but um, it, it's again, as I said before, you know, I, I'd be happy if that were really what we were talking about. Um, what is the role of various, um, you know, sources of energy as we uh, try to make this transition to a, a fossil-free energy economy? The argument that's typically made in support of shale, developing the Marcellus shale, the natural gas um, that exists in these reserves, is that uh, at least nominally they have a, a lower carbon footprint than other sources of fossil fuel energy. Certainly lower uh, footprint than the tar sands oil that would be delivered uh, by the Keystone XL pipeline, and a, a lower carbon footprint than coal, about a factor of two lower. So for each watt of power you generate, you generate about half as much CO2 with natural gas as with coal. Now the problem is uh, there are other, you know, what we call environmental externalities. There are other things that the process of fractional, you know, hydraulic fracturing, fracking, um, degrades uh, groundwater. Um, we know there are chemicals used in fracking that are uh, a contaminant that are potentially degrading uh, groundwater, our, our water supplies. How do you put a dollar value on that? Uh, another issue, and perhaps the, the biggest issue here, is what we call fugitive uh, methane. Um, there's evidence that in the process of fracking, um, uh, the, the fracturing process, you release some of the methane that you're trying to get at, some of it escapes into the atmosphere. And it turns out that methane is a ten time, or, uh, roughly 10 times more potent uh, greenhouse gas than CO2. It exists in much lower concentrations, but it's much more potent. 
And it turns out if there's a large enough amount of this um, fugitive methane that's making it into the atmosphere, that could easily offset any nominal gains that, uh, that, that natural gas would appear to have based on its CO2 footprint alone. So what we're dealing with are, you know, is decision making in the face of uncertainty. There are uncertainties about uh, the extent of this uh, fugitive methane, um, and depending on how much uh, fugitive methane there is, it may not be uh, a, 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 as optimal a strategy as some have argued it to be. And of course, the only truly safe means of um, uh, energy production if we're trying to guard against worsening the greenhouse gas and the global warming problem is to derive our energy from something other than fossil fuels. Methane is still a fossil fuel. It may not be as bad from a greenhouse gas standpoint as coal, and even that's debated. But we need to be bringing our emissions to a peak now and bringing them down. And developing natural gas, methane, um, exploiting the, the Keystone XL, uh, the, the tar sands through the Keystone XL pipeline is taking us in the opposite direction of where we need to go. And Ben may have some additional... Let's suppose for a moment, perhaps unrealistically, that our legislatures actually came to their senses. We're still a small part of the earth, and China is rapidly colonizing Africa for gas and other things, and what effect would it have if we did something and the rest of the world did nothing? That's a great question. Uh, and, and Ben, I'll, I'll make some comments, and Ben, I'm sure, has uh, some thoughts as well. Um, I think it's a matter of, you know, America, we've always prided ourselves in, in being leaders. Uh, around the world and leading the world. Um, and here we're falling behind. Uh, even if you look at China, China in, is investing far more in renewable energy than we are. Of course, they're sort of hedging their bets. Uh, they're building a coal-fired power plant every five days, but they're investing a lot more in, in solar technology. Uh, they are actually having a serious discussion in China about passing a carbon tax. Um, so China, and if you look at India, if you look at uh, um, Brazil, uh, many of the, uh, much of the developing world is actually investing far more in renewable energy than we are here in the U.S. And so we're following, falling behind. Um, we are fo becoming followers rather than leaders in sort of the 21st century energy economy. Um, and I think uh, it's really a, a matter of setting, you know, setting a good example for the rest of the world. After all, we had the luxury of two centuries of, of access to cheap fossil fuel energy. Um, and if we are to tell other countries that are just now industrializing that they don't have the right to that same cheap energy that we exploited for two centuries, how are we to do that if we don't have our own house in order? If we are not taking the actions that we need to have to decrease our own carbon footprint? Um, we don't set a very uh, good example for the rest of the world if we're asking China and India and the rest of the developing world to be part of the solution if we're not going to be part of the solution. Um, I, I would just, from my perspective, I, I would just um, state that uh, an argument that is used regarding reduction of CO2 is that you need to get the whole world on board and they will state that China is now going to be the biggest producer and it'll be followed by India. But I would, I would say to Mike's comments is the, the, that the US has the opportunity to lead on this regard and then that others can follow. Um, when I think about climate change, I mean, I've always, in this country, I've been, since the day I, I came here, 2004, so 10 years ago, and... I've been asked virtually the same question for, four t for 10 years now. Is climate changing? I mean, Mike made this great statement that we need to move beyond this. And so we keep on coming back to the same thing of whether climate is changing. And once we accept that, then we can think about how are we going to solve this problem. The US spends more money on climate change research than anywhere else on this planet. We should be leaders in mitigation and adaptation. 
that is the way forward for this country. I also, depending on what side of the bed I wake up on, um, it depends whether I'm really positive about the future or really negative about the future. I got up this morning, I was positive. I was coming back to Penn. I always like coming back to Penn. There are more scientists on the planet in this year than there were last year. There are more. When I was at Penn, I was teaching fantastic, sharp, young minds. They are the future and they can solve this problem. But we need to all move and sing to the same song sheet about climate change. The evidence is, is incredible. I find it really... one of the I, I, I recently, So I'd like to ask Mike's opinion at some point on how we, how we... Even though the data is so overwhelming, how we get this across to the general public. I was involved in a feature film, a, a documentary film called Shored Up. And um, I was asked about this. And I, I, when I was at Penn, I found it incredible that people thought that I lied about data. I thought it was interesting that they thought that I got students in to work in my lab and I shut the door and said, well, hey, what we're going to do is we're just going to make up some numbers here. We're not going to do any research. You can go out, you go to the bar or go out to the coffee shop. But all I want you to do is just make up numbers, come back to me and we'll publish it. Well, we're transitioning. Um, I'll attempt to <laughs> address Ben's question. Um, you know, I, I think a lot of uh, the problem that we have when it comes to discussing matters like climate change, uh, the problem is symptomatic of an even greater problem we have right now, which is sort of the loss of good faith discourse um, in society. Uh, and, you know, it was once famously uh, said by uh, a former senator of New York, uh, Patrick Moynihan, uh, famously said, you're entitled to your own opinions, but not your own facts. Well, you know, in today's world, it appears when it comes to matters like climate change, people are entitled to their own facts. And so if you don't like the facts, as reported by the National Academy of Sciences, as reported by the 30 plus scientific societies in the US that deal in the, any of the aspects of science of climate, um, the National Academies of all the major industrial nations, uh, the world scientific community, if you don't like the facts as reported by them, there's a whole cable network available to you, um, which is happily, which is happy to um, present an alternative reality where the laws of physics don't uh, behave in the way that uh, scientists uh, claim them to behave. And that, it's very difficult, uh, right? Um, especially with sort of the, 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 the balkanization of our media, sort of in the new media environment. There's sort of this loss of, of trusted um, voices. You know, when I was growing up, we'd all, you know, I'm, I'm old enough to remember being gathered around uh, the television, you know, around dinner time, listening to Walter Cronkite tell us, you know, that's the way it was. And we all accepted that that's the way it was on March 19th, 2014. And we could differ in our opinions about what that meant, but we all accepted the facts. We now live in a media environment where people are able to sort of trap themselves in a self-reinforcing bubble um, where they, their own misconceptions and biases and preconceptions are reinforced. Um, and it's very difficult in that environment uh, to break through in the way that we need to. Uh, I don't think it's hopeless. I think it's just a greater challenge now than it would have been if we had acted on this problem decades ago as we should have. Um, oh, okay. I, I have a microphone, so um, <laughs> I guess I'll ask it then. Um, so I was curious, um, who is funding this campaign um, against basically um, the scientific uh, facts about uh, climate change? Is it like just the uh, coaches um, or is it uh, Exxon, Mobil, uh, BP? And second part of the question, really the part I want to ask is if it is the latter, um, do you think we at the university could do something by potentially divesting uh, from uh, those companies? What do you think of that idea? Um, well, I, I, the um, problem regarding the acceptance of climate change is obviously related to special interest groups. I think it is a problem of education. It's a problem of outreach and making the message to the general public more accessible and understandable. Um, I think that there is, I find it, um, you, you, I always try and strive to explain things in, 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 the best, in the simplest possible manner to try and get my message across. I think that the special interest groups, it's, it's sometimes very hard to um, 
communicate with these people. So I mentioned that right at the start, the NC20 groups. So they're a group of landowners and retail managers and the sea level rise rates that we were projecting would um, inhibit some of their development. And what we, I was trying to do was saying, well, sea level rise rates are this, but if we look at North Carolina, there are areas in North Carolina that have existed for 4,000 years, and they're going to exist into the future. So you go and invest there, but I know exactly where you shouldn't invest, because these places are going to be hit by the next hurricane, and they're going to be wiped out. But they don't want to listen. And I think that they're doing a great disservice to the people of North Carolina. So maybe it is a grassroots issue. So maybe on the grassroots, the, the lo local people can come together and, and devolve themselves from um, the special interest groups. But I think it's also, that Mike said that how efficient they are. So we wrote a paper in um, Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences on sea level change. And this was leaked before it came out in the journal. So the moment it appeared in the journal, a variety of websites came up discrediting our science. So was, I have this, because I give a lecture sometimes on it, and um, um, my name was Frontline and Centre saying that I was, um, a Horton is a climate liar. Underneath it, it said that I was a psychopath. And then it got a third fact wrong. Um, it said I was American. Uh, <laughs> But that came out like that. And then all the websites came up and tried to discredit our work immediately. And they were very glossy and they're very well informed. Yeah, just sort of to add a little bit uh, more to that. Um, so there is, uh, you know, as I alluded to, I, I said there's a well-organized and a well-funded campaign, uh, and there's a whole literature that you can go to. In fact, uh, there's a, a guy here at Drexel, Bob Bruhl, who's an expert on the, the, the financing of the climate change disinformation campaign. And you, you do see, uh, you know, it used to be primarily funded by ExxonMobil and other uh, large fossil fuel interests. And what happened was that, um, you know, they're somewhat more answerable to, to uh, their shareholders and to the public. And so instead what you now see is sort of a dark money um, funding of climate change denial. The Exxon Mobiles, the fossil fuel interests have sort of declined in how much funding um, they are uh, doing uh, because of all the public pressure and the criticism, but almost in perfect anti-correlation with that decline is an incline in the amount of dark money. Typically, you know, we know from uh, various lines of evidence, much of it coming from, for example, Koch Industries, the Koch brothers, but also uh, the SCAFE foundations, um, a, a number of large uh, conservative foundations literally spending hundreds of millions of dollars on ma the manufacture of uh, a disinformation campaign. Um, and it is very much, there's a book uh, that I sometimes talk about in my, the longer version of my lecture, uh, The Merchants of Doubt by Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway, which is about sort of the origins of this industry funded campaign originally um, to deny the health impacts of tobacco, but then to deny the impacts of ozone depletion, of acid rain. Any time the findings of science have come into conflict with vested interests, there has been an industry-funded, financed, um, a fairly well-organized campaign to discredit that science. And climate change is no different. So there are groups like, you know, Americans for Prosperity. Who couldn't like prosperity? That sounds great, right? Um, until you know that it's just a front group for the Koch brothers, and primarily what they do is manufacture misinformation and disinformation when it comes to issues like climate change to make sure that we can't have that meaningful political discourse that we need to have about how to solve this problem. They want to make sure we don't even get there. As long as they can divide the public, and they recognize that, if you can divide the public, you don't have to win the argument. You just have to divide the public and, and make sure that there will be no, no progress um, on the policy front. And, and that's what we're currently seeing. <clears throat> One reason I have for optimism is the fact that we're starting to see some splintering within the conservative movement on this issue. You are seeing conservatives like uh, Bob Inglis, who is a, a conservative Republican from South Carolina, a former congressman, who's leading, up an, uh, leading an effort to find uh, free market-driven ways of pricing carbon. So ways of, of you know, accepting the science, accepting uh, the challenge, and finding ways 
to, to solve the problem consistent with you know, conservative politics. And you know, I think increasingly you're seeing sort of the intellectual conservatives become uncomfortable, <laughs> frankly, in being uh, al you know, allied with the anti-science um, and uh, the, 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 the you know, the, the anti-science and the attacks on science that we see, you know, in, in some corners in the, in the far right. And so, you know, even, you know, uh, I think it was Grover Norquist, the, uh, you know, the, the anti-tax um, uh, figure in the Republican Party, um, actually, was actually briefly on record saying that he could, he could support a uh, a revenue neutral carbon tax. Um, now he retracted that within 24 hours, apparently after he had heard from one of those brothers from Kansas that I referred to. Um, but we are starting to see some splintering within the conservative of movement on this issue. And I think where we'll, the hope is that we'll get a, sort of the, the reasonable contingent of, um, of, the, uh, of, of the Republican side of our spectrum will sort of come over uh, and help form a, a governing coalition to do something about the problem. Well, that's, so, you know, I, I can speak briefly about that too. Um, so, you know, Bill McKibben is actually, uh, the, who founded the organization 350.org, um, has uh, also spearheaded um, a, a divestment campaign to try to get universities to divest themselves of fossil fuel interests who are in participating um, in the funding of climate change denial. Uh, and I think that started with Unity College in Maine, which is a small college. It was fairly easy for them to do that. It's much more of a challenge for a large state university, given the uh, underlying politics, um, uh, to, to accomplish that. Nonetheless, I think it's a laudable goal. I think it's uh, a movement that has the, you know, the potential to draw upon you know, the energy that Ben was talking about, the energy of the youth, the fact that uh, you know, the college age folks, younger folks get it. They understand this is about the, their future. They understand we have a problem. Um, they're on board um, and we need to help them find ways that they can actually um, uh, help uh, move us forward. Um, and this, the divestment campaign is absolutely one way to try to do that. We know that it worked in the anti-apartheid movement. Um, it really drew public attention to the apartheid um, uh, problem in, in, in South Africa. And I think similarly, it has the potential to shift the dialogue when it comes to the issue of climate change. Because af after all, just like apartheid, to me, climate change is an ethics issue. It, it, it's a different somewhat different ethics issue, but it's nonetheless an issue of ethics. And I think that, you know, it's great that Bill McKibben and others, I think Penn State is actually, there's a divest Penn State movement, and uh, I think they're having a conference next month. I, I think I'm supposed to Skype in from wherever uh, I'm going to be at the time to, to, to speak to them. Um, and like I said, it's a laudable uh, movement.